Welcome to video one of AP Statistics chapter 23. Today we're going to start talking about inference about means. Now that we know how to create confidence intervals and test hypotheses about proportions, it'd be nice to be able to do the same thing for means. Just as we did before, we will base both our confidence interval and our hypothesis test on the sampling distribution model. The central limit theorem told us that the sampling distribution model for means is normal with a mean mu and a standard deviation of sigma over square root of n. All we need is a random sample of quantitative data and the true population standard deviation sigma. Well, that's a problem. Because if we know sigma, we know something about the whole population. We probably know mu, which is the population mean, and we don't need to do inference. This is an issue. Proportions have a link between the proportion value and the standard deviation of the sample proportion. This is not the case with means. Knowing the sample mean tells you nothing about the standard deviation of y hat. Um, uh, excuse me, y bar. We'll do the best we can. Estimate the population parameter sigma with this sample statistic s. So our resulting standard error is standard error of y bar or x bar um, is dependent on whether you're calling your individuals x or y. Um, in our book, our authors call the individuals y, so we talk about y bar. In the calculator, we talk about x and x bar. It means the same thing. It means the sample average of the individual observations. Anyway, it equals s over square root of n. We now have extra variation in our standard error from s, the sample standard deviation. We need to allow for the extra variation so that it does not mess up the margin of error and p-value, especially for a small sample. And the shape of the sampling model changes because of that extra variation. Um, the model is no longer normal. So what is the sampling model? William S. Gossett, an employee of the Guinness Brewery in Dublin, Ireland, worked long and hard to find out what the sampling model was. The sampling model that, that Gossett found has been known as Students T. Guinness Brewery didn't want to be associated with something as new and novel as statistics uh, as a field of study, and so they wouldn't let Gossett publish um, his findings under his own name. So he had to use a pseudonym, and so he used the pseudonym student. So it's students T. The students T models form a whole family of related distributions that depend on a parameter known as degrees of freedom. We often denote degrees of freedom as df and the model as t with a subscript of df, the degrees of freedom. Okay, a confidence interval for means. A practical sampling distribution model for means. When the conditions are met, the standardized sample mean t equals y bar minus mu over the standard error of y bar follows a student's t model with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. We estimate the standard error with standard error of y bar equals s over square root of n. When Gossett corrected the model for the extra uncertainty, the margin of error got bigger. Your confidence intervals will be just a bit wider and your p-values just a bit larger than they were with the normal model. By the t model, you've compensated for the extra variability in precisely the right way. When the conditions are met, we are ready to find the confidence interval for the population mean mu. The confidence interval is y bar, our estimate for mu, plus or minus t with n minus 1 degrees of, de free, degrees of freedom star times the standard error of y bar, where the standard error of, um, of the mean is standard error y bar equals s over square root of n. The critical value t with n minus 1 degrees of freedom star depends on the particular confidence level c that you specify and on the number of degrees of freedom n minus 1 which we get from the sample size. Students t models are unimodal, symmetric, and bell-shaped just like the normal model. But t models with only a few degrees of freedom have much fatter tails than the normal. That's what makes the margin of errors bigger. 
As the degrees of freedom increase, the T models look more and more like the normal model. So you can see up here, here in the, the dashed curve is the normal, standard normal curve. And then the solid curve there is a T model with two degrees of freedom. And you can see it's got fatter tails. Now, as degrees of freedom increase, the more and more normal the T model will become. In fact, the T model with infinite degrees of freedom is exactly normal. Gossett found the T model by simulation. Years later, when Sir Ronald A. Fisher showed mathematically that Gossett was right, he needed to make some assumptions to make the proof work. We will use these assumptions when working with students T. The independence assumption. So the independence assumption states that the data value should be independent. And we can make that assumption if we can check a couple of conditions. The randomization condition, the data arrives from a random sample or suitably randomized experiment. Um, randomly sampled data, particularly from an SRS, are ideal. And the 10% condition, when a sample is drawn without replacement, the sample should be no more than 10% of the population. The other assumption we want to make is the normal population assumption, but we can never be certain that the data are from a population that follows a normal model. However, we can check the nearly normal condition. The data come from a distribution that is unimodal and symmetric. You're going to check this condition by making a histogram or normal probability plot. The smaller the sample size, especially in um, less than 15 or so, the more closely the data should follow a normal model. For moderate sample sizes, in between 15 and 40 or so, the T works well as long as the data are unimodal and reasonably symmetric. For larger sample sizes, the T methods are safe to use unless the data are extremely skewed. We like large sample sizes. The student's T model is different for each value of degrees of freedom. Because of this, statistics books are usually have one table of T model critical values for selected confidence levels. That's our table T. Alternatively, we could use technology to find T critical values for any number of degrees of freedom and any confidence level you need. So what technology could we use? Any graph and calculator or, stati or statistics program. Remember that interpretation of your confidence interval is key. You should not say 90% of all the vehicles on Triphammer Road drive at the speed at a speed between 29.5 and 32.5 miles per hour. The confidence interval is always about the mean, not the individual values. We are 90% confident that a randomly selected vehicle will speed between 29 and 32.5 miles per hour. Again, the confidence interval is about the mean, not the individual values. Both of these statements are about individual values and are incorrect. Um, do not say the mean speed of the vehicle is 31 miles per hour 90% of the time. The true mean does not vary. It's the confidence interval that would be different had we gotten a different sample. 90% of all samples will have mean speeds between 29.5 and 32.5 miles per hour, should not be said. The interval we calculate does not set a standard for every other interval. It is no more or less likely to be correct than any other interval. So what should you say? Here's what you want to say. 90% of intervals that could be found in this way would cover the true value. Or put it in context, make it more personal, and say, I am 90% confident that the true mean is between 29 and 32.5 miles per hour. Remember to make pictures. Pictures tell us far more about our data set than a list of data ever could. The only reasonable way to check the nearly normal condition is with the graphs of the data. Make a histogram of the data and verify that its distribution is unimodal and symmetric with no outliers. You may also want to make a normal probability plot to see that it's reasonably straight. Okay, so now let's talk about tests for the mean. Um, the conditions for the one sample t test for the mean are exactly the same as for the one sample t interval. We test the hypothesis h naught mu equals mu naught using the statistic t n minus 1 equals y bar minus mu naught over the standard error of y bar, where the standard error of y bar is s over the square root of n. 
When the conditions are met and the null hypothesis is true, the statistic follows a student's t model with n minus 1 degrees of freedom, and we'll use that model to obtain a p value. Remember that statistically significant does not mean actually important or meaningful. Because of this, it's always a good idea to check um, when we have uh, when we test a hypothesis to check the confidence interval and think about likely values for the mean. Confidence intervals and hypothesis tests are built from the same calculations. In fact, they are complementary ways of looking at the same question. The confidence interval contains all the null hypothesis values we can't reject with these data. More precisely, a level C confidence interval contains all the plausible null hypothesis values that would not be rejected by a two-sided hypothesis test at alpha level 1 minus C. So a 95% confidence interval matches a 0.05 level two-sided test for these data. Confidence intervals are naturally two-sided, so they match exactly with two-sided hypothesis tests. When the hypothesis is one-sided, the corresponding alpha level is 1 minus C over 2. Sample size. To find the sample size needed for a particular mar uh, confidence level with a particular margin of error, solve the, this equation for N. So your margin of error equals um, T star for N minus 1 degrees of freedom times S over square root of N. The problem with using the equation above is that we don't know most of the values. We can overcome this with a couple of um, methods here. We can use S from a small pilot study, and we can use Z star in place of the necessary T value. The problem with using T is that you have to know N to know N minus 1 degrees of freedom. So Z star can be what we use instead. Sample size calculations are never exact. The margin of error you find after collecting the data won't match exactly the one you use to find n. The sample size formula depends on quantities you won't have until you collect the data, but using it is an important first step. Before you collect data, it's always a good idea to know whether the sample size is large enough to give you a good chance of being able to tell you what you want to know. If we knew the true population mean mu, we would find the sample standard deviation as s equals the square root of the sum of y minus mu squared over n. But we use y bar instead of mu, though, and that causes a problem. When we use the sum of y minus y bar squared instead of y minus mu, the sum of y minus mu squared to calculate s, our standard deviation estimate would be too small. The amazing mathematical fact is that we can compensate for the smaller sum exactly by dividing by n minus 1, which we call the degrees of freedom. So what can go wrong? Don't confuse proportions and means. This class is so much about critical reading um, that it's almost more like a reading class than a math class. Um, so please read carefully. There's not a whole lot of tricks. Just read what the problem says and determine whether it's about proportions or means. Ways to not be normal. Beware of multimodality. The nearly normal condition clearly fails if a histogram of the data has two or more modes. Beware of skewed data. If the data are very skewed, try re-expressing the variable. Set outliers aside, but remember to report on these outliers individually. And of course, watch out for a bias. We can never overcome the problems of a biased sample. Make sure data are independent. Check for random, random sampling in 10% condition if there is um, if sampling is done without replacement. Make sure that data are from an appropriately randomized sample. Okay, make sure of those things and you should be fine. Okay, guys, and of course, again, interpret your confidence interval carefully. Uh, many statements that sound tempting are, in fact, misinterpretations of a confidence interval for a mean. A confidence interval is about the means, about the mean of the population, not about the means of samples, individuals in the samples or individuals in the population. All right, we'll come back and do a video on the examples next.